It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Nadim Z. Baba, DMD, MSD, FACP. He received his DMD degree from the University of Montreal in 1996. He completed a certificate in advanced graduate studies in prosthodontics and a master's degree in restorative sciences in prosthodontics from Boston University School of Dentistry in 99. He serves as a professor in the advanced education program in prosthodontics at Loma Linda University School of Dentistry and maintains a part-time practice in Glendale, California. He is currently the president-elect of the American College of Prosthodontists and an active member of various other professional organizations. He is a fellow of the American College of Prosthodontists and a diplomat of the American Board of Prosthodontics. He's involved in the editorial process for several dental journals, is the author of numerous publications, has published a book entitled Restoration of Endodontically Treated Teeth, Evidence-Based Diagnosis and Treatment Planning, and is the recipient of many honors and awards that he's lectured around the world. My gosh, I don't even know if I'm smart enough to podcast you. Thank you. You, you. You're so sweet. <laughs> oh my gosh! So um, let's start. Let's start in prosthodontics. Let's start with the um, you know the the the, the people that listen to podcasts. And, you know, I always tell them send me an email, Howard at dentaltown dot com. Tell me where you live, what country you're in, how old you are, uh, what you think of the show, and um, bottom line is I'm 55. I only get like one 55 year old person, you know, a month maybe. Uh, they're all under 30. They're all millennials, and they're coming out of school $350,000 in debt. I talked to a guy the other day. It was $550,000 in debt. And one of their big questions is, do they have to buy a $150,000 CAD cam machine to be an amazing prosthodontist like you? No, they don't, Howard. The good thing today is you have the major labs that we work with can outsource the work. So you, you, you just don't have to invest too much if you're just out of dental school and then, or, or out of prosthodontics program. You don't have to invest too much into buying a lot of equipment because what you can do is you can send your impressions to, to some designated labs that do, do CAT CAM milling and they can do the design as, as much as the milling for you. Or if you want to invest a little bit more, you can invest into an intraoral scanner or a lab scanner and have your impressions either uh, scanned or, or you can directly make the impression intraorally and then send it to these labs to do whatever you want to do with, with, with this STL file. So what scanner, um, what, what do you have in your office or what, what do you like? I, I have an intraoral scanner from Dental Wings. Dental and, Wings? Yes, Dental Wings. Can you but send me that, a, Ryan? It's a company um, based in Montreal. And the reason why I, I got it, because the, the capturing device is very small. It, it's the size of the handpiece. It's not heavy. And you can either use with powder or without powder. And, and it helps you do whatever, whatever you're looking for. It's from single crown to a three-unit FPD, or to a single implant. And so you went to school in Montreal? Yes, I went to school in Montreal. I so, did. So did you uh, ever learn how to speak French while you were there? <laughs> well, actually, I, I am trilingual. I, I, I do speak three languages before getting into dental school. So I do speak French, Arabic, and English. Wow, that's uh, those are three. That that's half the UN languages. They, the UN only does business in six languages. Yeah, so right. uh, you uh, you should be at least um, a half qualified uh, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, so which one is the hardest to speak, French, Arabic, or English? Um, actually, I started with Arabic because I was born in the Middle East. Then I learned French in school, and the last language I learned was English. So at this stage of my life, I feel very comfortable with English, much more than, than French. Um, both, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the writing part. Uh, speaking, um, they're equally, equally fine for me. Huh, that is amazing. I, uh, I, I live 100 miles from uh, Mexico, so I would give anything to speak Spanish, but it was the only D I ever got in my life was in high school Spanish. My uh, Spanish teacher, uh, uh, San Martin, told my mother that I was linguistically retarded. <laughs> he said, and uh, he said, you're never going to teach this kid a language. So, um, you know, the, the um, 
Or is CAD CAM taking off ch chair side milling? I mean, I wanted to see was chair side milling from lab lab CAD CAM, but is how, how many prosthodonts are there? About a, about what is it? There, there, there's around three thousand eight hundred to nine hundred orthodon uh, prosthodonts. Thirty eight hundred. Yes. Is that for the United States or the whole world? No, I'm talking about members of the American College of Prosthodontists. Okay, so just America. Yeah. Just just United States, thirty eight hundred. How there many prosthodontists that are not that are not uh, part of the American College of Postadon, so they're not they're not members, but those who are members, they're around around thirty eight hundred. And how many of them do you think chairside mill? Um, don't, the, 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 I can't give you an exact number, but I know that that our colleagues are, are getting more into CAT CAM, whether it's fixed or removable, and I know for the fact also that we are basically considered the leaders in CAT CAM dentistry and, and to the point that the American College of Postodonists got an unrestricted fund from Henry Schein to put together a digital curriculum to, because the, Henry Schein recognized that the ACP has that power to be the leader in, in CAT CAM uh, digital dentistry. So, so the, the, the ACP has put together a digital curriculum and we are now trial testing it in five different schools, and hopefully down the road we'll have a lot of school kind of uh, adopt that digital curriculum and implement it into their, their, their daily curriculum. Because don't forget, Howard, CAT CAM is here to stay. There's a lot of people have a lot of people have thought that CAT CAM is gonna is not gonna work because it's expensive because it doesn't it wasn't very accurate. But don't forget, technology goes very fast. And, and the, the, the technology is evolving, evolving very fast, and, um, and it's becoming more and more accurate. The, now, it, you remember CEDEC came, in in the, came out in the 80s, I mean, even before, but in the 80s it became popular in, in the United States. And since then, the, the, the CAD CAM process has evolved, not, not only in fixed, but in maxillofacial, in removable, so it's, it's here to stay, and even in, in implant dentistry, so it's, it's here to stay. Well, I remember back in the 80s, whenever you were talking to the CIRAC people, the, the, the limiting um, constraint was the size of the microprocessors. Yes. And, and I mean, they, they could write, you know, the, the, the amount of code they could write was so limited. But as uh, Intel went from the, remember, my, my, first, my, my first dental office in 87, my, my office computer was an Intel 286. <laughs> I mean, I bet a, I bet a Motorola flip phone has more power than that darn thing. And I then know. it was the then it was the uh, two eighty six and the three eighty six. Then it was the Pentium. And uh, but as those processors got bigger and bigger and bigger, they could just write a lot more fancy, elaborate code. But you're even using CAD CAM in dentures. Yes, we are. How's how's that yeah. going? Talk about that. The the interesting thing about about complete dentures is that. You can, you can do two processes. You can either make an impression, send it to the lab, and from there, using some anatomic landmarks, they, they virtually set up the teeth for you, and they can mill the dentures and send them back to you to, to, to get them trial and delivered. Now, and the, 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 the other process is basically now what we, we're trying to do is to try to get acquired an impression intraorally using the intraoral uh, scanners and design the dentures from there. So th there's a lot of trials being done and all around the United States by different colleagues. Um, at Loma Linda here, um, we've tried a couple cases where we use different devices to um, acquire an impression intraorally and we, we got dentures milled out of these and the dentures came out very nice. So a lot of, um, it's amazing how um, it's so American to want to have an instant all on four. I mean, you know, you, you, you don't yeah. take care of your teeth, you neglect them, and you go in there and one day you take everything out, put everything in. It's so American. But, you know, it's um, watching this for a decade, 
I mean, the people who lost all their teeth and needed all on four, you know, these, these weren't vegans who um, went to yoga three times a day. These were some of the, uh, I would say, the more uh, wild Irish drinking, smoking, you know, they, they, and it seems like a lot of these all-on-fours and a lot of these uh, fixed uh, implant cases, when they, they come in, they got a complete ham sandwich underneath their uh, fix. And I always wondered, um, you know, if it had been so much better, if it had been, um, um, you know, like a, a, you know, a ball and socket, a removable a denture um, with uh, four ball and sockets as opposed to uh, fix. I mean, so that grandpa could snap that thing out uh, morning and night and rinse it all off and brush it. What, what do you what do you think about that and the, the effect that would have on periimplantitis of fixed versus implant removable? Well, I, I, for sure I can, I can tell you that the, the decision between fixed or removable depends on many factors. But the first is the, the, the biologic factors the economic factors, the, you, you have the, the amount of bone loss, you, you, got, you, you get a lot of factors that are involved in there. So the way the media is put in it, like an all-on-four for everybody, I, I don't think it is for everybody. There, there should be a case analysis to make sure that that patient is a candidate for an all-on-four. Well, for some patients, given their dexterity, given their age, um, given the, the ability, the, the, the difficulty to clean, uh, the, like if they live in a hospital or in, a, in an assisted home, it, it might be easier for them to get something that, as you said, removable, they can, they can rinse it, rinse their mouth and put it back in. And again, it also depends how much can the patient afford. An all-on-four might not necessarily cost the same as an implant-supported overdenture. So th there's a big difference there in cost. So there's the cost of the implants, there's the cost of the, of the prosthesis. So, so it's, it's, it's much more expensive to get an all on four than, than an overdenture. Yeah, which is, um, which, which I get it. I mean, they, they just want, I think it's psychological. They just want to have something fixed that can never come out. I, I, I totally see the appeal of that. But man, you save so much money having an implant supported overdenture. And the cleaning. I mean, is is there is there noticeable less periimplantitis around um, implant supported overdentures as opposed to all on fours fixed? Again, it depends on the on the patient and their level of understanding um, about hygiene. Um, uh, if you look at the at the studies, um, it, it it all matters is how much is the patient investing into into his hygiene. Well, you can have a patient wearing an, a, a fixed uh, complete denture or a hybrid and not cleaning or not doing anything. Of course, they're going to get into, into periimplantitis and some, some other issues. And this could be also true for patient wearing an implant-supported overdenture. So it, 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 really, it really matters on a case-to-case -case basis. But what, what, I, what, I can, uh, what I can tell you is I always tell my patients that, you know, you, you can start with an overdenture because it's cheaper, but down the road, if you save money, you can have more implants and then and you can transform that overdenture um, or, you, or you can move from an overdenture to, to an implant fixed complete denture with time. Um, you know, when, when people go to the orthopedic surgeon and they get an artificial hip or a knee, um, they... Around here in Phoenix, anyway, I mean, it's the only area I know, they, they set the expectations very low. I mean, the, the doctor's always saying, you know, um, hopefully you can get, you know, five, seven years out of this. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think we, uh, these young kids should be telling them? Because some of these kids tell them, oh, this implant will be fine, it'll be perfect, and you'll take it to heaven with you someday. And none of the orthopedic surgeons say that about any of the, of the other body parts. What do you think a kid should be telling their patients when they say, how long will this implant last? And I know there's a ton of variables, but how do you, how do you frame that? It's an excellent question. Usually the patient asks, so are my implants forever? I said, well, if they were forever, we would be forever too. I, I tell them that there's nothing forever. Usually what I tell the patient, if you take care of your implants, they should serve you between 12 to 15 years. Well, I think it's probably uh, pushing it to, to the low side. I, mean, I know some of my colleagues will say more, but I, I personally, I think it's safer to, to give them less of a, of a lifespan than more. 
So if in case something happens to the implant, they don't get disappointed. But I usually tell them, you know, the lifespan is between, let's say, 12 to 15. But if you take care of them, they might last you much, much more. Yeah, yeah, I know there's a lot of uh, variables in that. Uh, but um, what you see, I mean, as a prosthodontist, um, what percent of your cases are treating a failed case, re- redoing a failed case versus oh. uh, starting a new case? Well, unfortunately, the area where I practice, the, the percentage of, of starting failing cases is pretty high. I get around, I should say, 65 to 70% of my cases are, are failing cases that are referred by either uh, periodontists or otosurgeons, or sometimes they just come in because they heard about me, and uh, it's like a word of mouth, but it, it's, a big, it's a big percentage. And, and why, why do you think they're failing? The, most of the problems with the failures are um, below standard prosthesis, whether fixed or removable. Um, occlusion is always badly designed. Um, and, and most of the time is the choice of the material, the choice of the prosthesis. Um, you notice that some people get engaged into these cases without any knowledge of occlusion, without any knowledge of, of vertical dimension. I mean, there, there's a lot of things that they omit that causes these patients uh, some issues. And, and unfortunately, most of the time, the patient have spent a lot of money, and then the failure comes in after like six months or nine months, and they're still paying their loans to, for that procedure that they got. And it's, it's frustrating for both the patient and myself because they come to me and they, they say, oh, I already spent $40,000. I don't have any more money. So what do you do? That They got something fixed that is failing and they end up with a complete denture. I mean, it, it's really frustrating for the patient. Oh, I know. Um, but, but when you talk about occlusion, I mean, I, I hear the cries of these uh, young kids in dental school. The, the, they basically will say this. They'll say, look, when you go into endodontics, the endodontists hardly argue about anything. Uh, when you go to pediatric dentistry, maybe the only thing they argue about is silver diamine fluoride. You know, some just love it and some don't care for it. But, man, when you go into occlusion, it, it, there's like five different world religions in the science of occlusion. You got neurolinguistic occlusion. You got CR. You have all these camps. How do you uh, – and the specific question is this. They come out of school. They say, I want to learn more about occlusion. And it looks like the universe, the, the programs are set up either neurolinguistic um, – um, programming or um, or um, CR. What, what what would you? What, what, do you agree that there's a lot of different schools of thought on inclusion? I agree with you on that one. There's a lot of thoughts depending on which school do you go to, and depending who teaches occlusion to the to the students or the residents. But there are some basic principles that we need to understand. Now, if, if they're going with a complete denture, you definitely need to to get the patient in centric relation. And now, if you're going with an implant fixed complete denture or hybrids, then you have to treat these cases as, as if they were fixed. So you have to make sure that the patient gets a canine guidance, get disclusion and protrusive, and, 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 and you have to treat it as if it was a fixed case. So, and, and that, that the difference. I know many times I see all these, these patients restored with hybrids or implant fixed complete dentures, and the occlusion is treated like as if it was a complete denture. And then you can see here, here and there, teeth breaking and popping out, and, and, and it, it gets the patient into, into a lot of difficulties. Well said. Um, what, did, what advice would you, uh, if, if a young kid comes out of school, well, you're, you're teaching Loma Linda. When, when, they, when they come out of school, how, um, how is their understanding of occlusion? Where, where do they go from there? Are they, do they usually come out and they're on top of it or more? more to- I, I can't say that. Um, I can't say that, but, but I know that, that a lot of students come out and they have issues with occlusion because it's either undertaught and it's a difficult subject. Now, um, one of my colleagues here at school and the previous dean of the, of the Loma Linda School, Dr. Charles Goodacre, developed an occlusion ebook that is um, um, available on eHuman. And, and any student or any person can, can download it. Can you for find that, Ryan? What is it? What, say for, it again. It's eHuman. E-human. Human. And it's, it's an ebook that, that anybody can download, but at, at the cost, of course, 
but but it, it has a lot of details on occlusion and it's the best resource for anybody to review occlusion once they graduate from dental school. Nice. How much is it? I, I have no idea. I, I honestly I don't know how much it is, but but I know it's it's affordable. So um, what do you think about um, uh, implant failures from cement left behind? Are you seeing much of that? Oh, this is the number one uh, failure that I see in my office. Um, people have issues with cementing crowns. I, I personally go with screw retained, so I don't, I don't have much of these issues in my office. But uh, and, and again, the reason why I go cement retained because now with guided surgery, there is no reason to have the implants off uh, of the axis or, or in a position that is extremely weird that it necessitate to have um, a, um, a, a custom abutment and, and then have, have the crown cemented. But those people who prefer the cement retained um, implant supported crowns, the, the thing is they are using all these uh, composite resin cement and, and, and studies have shown that they're very difficult to remove because they bond very well to the abutments. So even if you use scalers, I mean, even if you use plastic scalers or any type of other scalers, you're going to create scratches on these uh, abutments that will down the road cause this problem because plaque will, will adhere to these surfaces. Or, and, and I should say, there is always some remnants of cement that are left in there, and then this cement can cause uh, peri-implantitis and the loss of, of integration. What do, you, what do you think the um, least uh, toxic dental implant cement? I, I always thought it was funny that, you know, it's the, the box has dental implant cement. It has an ADA seal of approval, but if you leave any flash, it's toxic and causes peri-implantitis. That doesn't, all those things don't seem to go together. <laughs> uh, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, having the ADA seal approval doesn't mean that it's, it's an ideal cement to cement a crown on, a, on an implant abutment. Um, what, my recommendation usually when a student asks me that type of question is so avoid composite resin cements as much as you can. Now, either go with zinc phosphate, and, and we all know, and, and you know more than I do, that zinc phosphate is easy to remove after it sets. Um, you can either use um, a temporary cement like Tembond, but there are also some some other um, cements that are easy to remove. The most important part is to use a radio-opaque cement that you can see after you make an x-ray after cementation. Because the problem is so most of the composite resin cement are translucent. So you grab an x-ray after you cement your crown, you don't see anything. You say, oh, we're good to go. But the problem is you can't see it. Well, if you use an opaque cement, then you'll be able to see on the x-ray that you have something left in there. One, two, two good ways to avoid cements in the sulcus around an abutment. The first one is to place a cord. So you place a cord like you, you're making an impression for, for a single crown, and then you cement it, and then at the end you pull the cord out. The, the other way is to do um, a dye that you take some, some putty material, put it in the entire surface of the crown, and then when it sets, you get like a dye. So what you do is you mix the cement, put it in the intaglio surface of the crown, seat it on that putty dye, and then go ahead and cement intraorally. So that will eliminate most of the excess of cement so it doesn't go into the, the sulcus. But zinc phosphate, it, it, you, you don't like the resin cements, but with zinc, and you prefer to screw than uh, cement. 99% of my implant-supported crowns are screw retained. But if you were going to cement, would it be zinc phosphate? If I have to, to do something cement, I use Tembon. 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 Very, very good. Now, you know, they're always going to um, they're always gonna ask you, you're a prosthodontist. They, they want to know what implant system. It's so, it's so confusing when you, like right now, the Hinman meeting's going on. Um, we just had the Chicago Midwinter meeting. At, at the, the biggest dental meeting in the world is the uh, FDI meeting in Cologne, Germany. And they said there were 175 different implant systems uh, at the FDI. So how's this little kid supposed to come out of school and, and go through 175 systems? What, what advice would you give her? The best advice I can give somebody who graduates from school want to go into implants is to pick a company that has been there on the market for so long. They have a good customer service and they can back you up in case something fails. 
And that's my advice. And then the other thing is use a company that has given to the profession a lot. Now, the problem, and again, and nothing against any of the companies, but, but you get some of these small companies that are showing up, that giving some money incentive to these young dentists, and they give you a ticket to travel here and there to get a CE course. They give you so many implants, and they, they want to drag you in. God forbid something fails, they wash their hands and they run away. And that's the problem that, that most of the failures that I see, the intention of the dentist was good because, you know, he said, okay, I'll save a couple hundreds by buying the system because it's cheaper than the other one. But the problem is once they had the issue, they call the company, the company says, it's not my problem, that's yours. So stick, it, stick, stick around companies that have a history of success, a long track record that you, you know that these companies have provided service for the profession and for the specialties. True or false? Um, some people, um, first of all, when I got out of school in 87, I never thought I'd see the PFM go the way of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. I mean, that was uh, that was the modern cosmetic dentistry over gold crowns and amalgams. And um, But some people are, uh, I, I hear some people say that they think zirconium might be too hard for endodontically treated teeth. And that, the, that when you had a PFM, and you bit something hard, the weak spot was the porcelain chipping off the metal. But mm -hmm. now that there's zirconium isn't going to budge, does that mean the weak spot is going to be the endodontically treated tooth and have a root fracture? Um, that's a very difficult question to answer. But what I can tell you is that the problem with zirconia is to remove it. So, I mean, of course, now they're coming with new special burrs to, to remove zirconia. But, but it's still a hard material. And you're right, it might be a, an issue because what, whatever is going to take the load is your, your roots, it's not, not the crown. So, but, but I, I, honestly, I, I, I still believe there is room for, for PFM crowns and gold crowns. Uh, I, I, it's, I might be, I'm, I'm 50 years old, but I'm, I'm not that, that old, but I still believe that some patients, given the amount of, of, of bruxism they have, they'd be better off with just a, just a gold crown or a PFM crown. And I still personally uh, favor having um, glass ceramic anteriorly because it blends better with the gums and, 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 and the, the translucency that these material have look nicer. And posteriorly, well, I mean, why do you want to go crazy and, and it just for a second molar and get something that's super fancy and nice and nobody sees it? So at that stage, why not a PFM posteriorly? But again, it's debatable. It's, it's you know, it's so weird. There's so many cultural factors. Like I'm in Phoenix, so I'm 100 miles from Mexico. So you know, a quarter of my practice is Hispanic, um, a quarter of Arizona is American Indian. Uh, I've got a, a large um, African American population. All those girls will go gold. My all seven of my restorations are gold. But my gosh, you tell a European woman to put a gold crown on her tooth, and she looks at you like you're like you're from another planet. Yeah, I agree with you. And it, it's so frustrating because she'll have, you know, gold earrings, gold bar in her nose. She'll have gold wedding rings. She has, she has gold 10 different places on her body. And then when I say, guy, you grind your teeth, you, the, the teeth are small, it just, it'll just be perfect being gold. And everybody says yes, unless they're European-American, and then they're just like, no yeah, way. I, 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 I agree with you, and I know a lot of my, my colleagues from Europe and, you know, that, that I, I work with, they, they, they don't do any... Now, at the, at the stage, don't even, they don't even suggest the PFM crown. And, and gold is really out of question. But, but I, I, I hear you. I mean, you, you're right about it. Yeah, I, and, the, and we've, been talking, we've been talking for a half an hour. Have you even noticed any of my gold teeth? No. Yeah, I know. I know, and, and, I, and I can vouch for this. I'm very proud of this. And I can't believe I'm saying it on a podcast, but three times it was a second molar, and I just I, I, I didn't have any options. And she yeah. said, no, 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 I don't want gold. Cemented a gold crown on her second molar because it was short, far back. To this day, they don't even know it. I mean, I, I'm like the only one that knows she has a gold crown on her second molar. Yeah. You know, but uh, huh, that's, uh, that's <laughs> crazy. So what would you say, uh, about 25% of our listeners are still in school. What would you say to her if she thought, you know what? Maybe I want to specialize and be a prosthodontist. What, 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 what do you think of that decision? I think 
this is the best time to be a prosthodontist. This is the best time to be a prosthodontist, honestly. I think we, if you look at the amount of work we have, if we look at the, um, the advancement in materials, um, if you look at the, um, the, the CAT cam or, or the digital world that we're going into, prosthodontists are going to be the leader in that world. And we are already, and we're going to be more in the future. So I think this is the best time to be a prosthodontist. Yes, some people might tell me, but it's three years extra, and I have to get another loan for three years, but it's worth it. Um, when they come out of school, they, they, a prosthodontist has to pick a business model because some prosthodontics and their training, their programs, they place the implants. Mm -hmm. And then I have a lot of prosthodontists that are friends says, I can't do that. I get all my referrals from periodontists and oral surgeons that are placing these implants. What would you say? Should they master placing the implants and then risk not getting referrals from periodontists and oral surgeons? Or would you just stick to restoring? If you look at, at the, the, the CODA, and, and CODA has said that prosthodontists need to learn how to place implants during their residency. Now, to be able to graduate. Now, if, if, if after they graduate, they have a couple options. So if they're in an area where there's no oral surgeons, no periodontists around them, they're the only one in there, well, what's the, what's the look? they're not losing anything. So they can put their own implants and even put implants for others and restore them. Now, you get some people that say, well, as you said, I don't want to lose any referrals because I'm going to be working in an office that relies heavily on referrals from periodontists or oral surgeons. Now, this then they have no choice. Or you can do a combination of both. And I know some of my colleagues, what they do is they single implants or easy implants in the posterior area, they do it themselves. And when it comes to complicated stuff, they refer them out. But it, again, there's no ideal model. Everybody has to work it out according to the area where they're going to be practicing and, and what type of practice they're going to be working in. Here's another uh, question. I'm just throwing oddball questions at you, but um, when you're in school, you have an articulator. And then when you come out of school, what, what percent of your cases actually do you do a face bow transfer? When, when do you need to do a face bow transfer and use an articulator? That's a very really good question. Now, if you're doing a complete denture, now, we, we, we usually, 99% of the time, use a face bow. Now, if you're using a, doing a full mouth rehab, or a maxillary arch or a mandible arch, or, or a cases where um, canines are involved and you want to work your occlusion pretty well, you better have them uh, mounted on a, on an art, on a semi-adjustable articulator. But if you're doing a single crown, um, you know, a, a, a small FPV posteriorly, I mean, you don't really need a face ball. But now, with the, with the introduction of digital dentistry and CAT CAM, now, don't forget now, what we can do is they virtually mount these these uh, impressions that you make, you, they, they, they mount them virtually on an articulator, and it's a virtual articulator that can, can work the occlusion in there. So to answer your question, probably down the future, maybe an articulator won't be necessary, I, and I probably see that. Now, if you look at the, the systems that are being built these days for CAD CAM removable, you, you don't necessarily need an articulator anymore. So, down the road, probably, we won't, won't have a need for articulators. What about Maryland Bridges? Maryland Bridges, have they still have their own place. Not everybody can afford implant if they're, if they're missing congenitally, congen if they're congenitally missing laterals. So, I believe that doing Maryland Bridges is nothing wrong with it. It's, it has its place, and uh, either the patient is too young to get an implant, or they can't afford to get an implant. I think this is the alternative, the best alternative they have. What, what do you, when you see failed, uh, when, when you see failed cases, what is the low-hanging fruit mistakes that came from the treatment planning side? Was it was it too many crowns for too few of implant? What 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 are what are the 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 most common treatment planning mistakes you're seeing? I think the problem is to see the big picture. And so people focus on on one particular area or they look at one particular tooth. 
and, or they look at one arch, but they forget that this mouth is part of a skull, of a part of a human being, and they have to look at the big picture. So what I say by the big picture is, if you restore in a case, you, you want to open the vertical, then you have to make a decision. Should I restore only the maxillary teeth, only the mandibular teeth, or both? And, and, then, and sometimes most of the problems is they don't see that. The, the other problem is, is occlusion. So they don't pay enough attention to occlusion. And the third problem is the mis or misplacement of the implants. The implant placed in odd positions where they can't be restored. So the treatment plan is extremely important because most of the people, and again, the mistakes they make, is either no x-rays, no CBCTs, no surgical guides, and the inability to see the big picture, and then zoom into the small picture. You know, when I got out of school in 87, my prosthodontist told us that um, we would witness the extinction of the denture. It was just going to go away. And it's funny now looking at the data because 30 years later, America does more dentures today than they did in 87. Um, what, what, is, what are the, um, it, and for a lot of dentists, I, here's one of my firm beliefs that if you don't do something once a week, you never really reach critical mass and quality, speed, efficiency. You know, you got to do it faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost. And the dentists are really, really good. We're actually all physicians, surgeons. They're really good if they do it at least once a week. That's 50 cases a year. But it seems like so many dentists doing the dentures, they get one like every six months. And you just really, it's just hard to master something that you do twice a year. But that's, that's what I tell my students. When sometimes they tell me, oh, you're so good at dentures. I say, well, I do an average of 10 dentures a month. So, so <laughs> you calculus, I've been a post since 1999, so you can figure out how many dentures I've made. Well, and then some of them say, oh, I just made two of them the whole year last year. So it, it is true. The more you make, the better you become. But to answer your question, if you look at the American census, either in Canada or in the United States, the edentulous patients are always going to be here. And then the problem is a lot of our colleagues, when they say, oh, I've never, I don't see dentures in my office, so probably they practice in a high-end neighborhood. But if you go to some other areas in the United States, people are poor. They don't have money for to get a high They're going to get a denture. So, it, again, it depends where you practice. But in general, yes, there will always be dentures. And the problem is, not a lot of schools are teaching removable the way it should be. That's the problem. Yeah, and um, the, the most common full mouth cosmetic rehab case in America is not the all on four, it's the all on none. Uh, for every person that dishes out 25,000 arch for a $50,000 full mouth all on four, there are a dozen all on nuns. But if you go to any of these dental conventions, all the courses are on the sexy all on four. Yeah. And there's exactly. no courses on the all on none, and um, and they they you know they they really turn a lot of lives around when they. I'm glad you said that because I personally think that a complete denture is a full mouth rehab, when it's 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 much more difficult actually than doing um, than doing crowns. I mean it's it's really much much more difficult because there's a lot of factors in there that you have to take into consideration to 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 get that denture where it should be. You get aesthetics, you get phonetics, you get the vertical dimension, you, you get the anatomy. So there's a lot of factors that are involved here. So, so I agree with you. It's, it's a full mouth rehab. But, but again, the problem is that removable is not being taught the right way. And there's a lot of uh, um, business to be made in it too because like if you go to the, the biggest brake manufacturer, the Meineke brakes, when you go there, they, they, their price are three. They have the, the low cost brakes. They have the medium, and then they have the, the premier. And um, a lot of people, when you show them, you know, here's your denture, but there's a lot of incredibly gorgeous upgraded teeth you can buy uh, from like Ivoclar and others. I mean, uh, some, some of these teeth are just, they're, they're, they're gorgeous. Yeah, you're right. You're right. There, there, there is a, there, there's also the way you make the dentures could also be economical to you. Now, as a prosthodontist, we learn to make dentures in three appointments. So, versus uh, what you learn in dental school as a five appointments, if not more. So that in, in itself 
saves us money because we, we have the know-how to make it in three appointments. And also, as you said, you, you can buy a set of teeth for, for this much dollars or you can buy a set of teeth for that much dollars depending on, on what type of quality the patient is looking for. Yes, I agree with you on that one. Yeah, and you know, when you reduce five appointments to three, you just cut out 40% of your costs. I mean, uh, I mean, the, it's oh, just that, what's that? Definitely, I agree with you. And the, the thing also is, is because introducing CAT CAN into the removable aspect of prosthodontics has also helped us also reduce the, the, the cost by itself. Because don't forget, before you had to make a preliminary impression, put the cast, make a custom, a custom tray, do bottom warning, final impression, the wax rims, the, the try-in, the teeth setup, and then the processing. Now what you can do is make an impression and then directly go to the teeth try-in and the patient is happy you deliver. So that by itself, you're using less material, less chair time, and it's more accurate. But provided you have to know the anatomy. And that's what I tell, tell my student all the time. Yes, technology is going to replace you working on the wax rims and you setting up teeth and you working on all this hard labor. But if you don't know your anatomy, you will have issues acquiring a decent um, final impression so to get a, a decent final complete denture. Do you ever use valplast anymore? No, I don't. And talk, talk about that. Why? Well, valplast by itself is a flexible material. So... Uh, you're talking about for, for, for making RPDs? Mm -hmm. so, yes. Yeah. Well, the problem is it, the flexibility of the valplast clasp themselves causes a lot of stress on the teeth. And if they're periodontally involved, you're going to end up losing them. So, it, yes, it looks nicer. Yes, it's very popular among general dentists, but it's not popular among prosthodontists because we know for a fact that it causes damage to the, to the natural teeth. So if you um, come to Phoenix and go down to the Mexican border, Nogales, Arizona, there's a lab company there that all the, all the uh, partials are, are mailed yep. there. Then they drive them across the border and they cast a thousand partials a day. A thousand. It's huge. So when I go down there and I look at all these pans, 90% mm -hmm. of all the pan just says lower partial. They didn't cut a single rest seat. They didn't. They didn't write anything on the lab script, just, just an impression, lower partial, nine out of 10. Yeah. And these guys are like, uh, and a lot of times they look at me and they say, I mean, really? What's wrong with your homies? You know? And it's like, so what, what, what do you, does, does that make you, I mean, what, what, when I said that, what does it make you think? It makes me think that I'm going to have more work to do. Well, the reality is, the, the, and, and I know what you're saying, that, that just, just grab an impression, send it to the lab, fabricate mandibular RPD, and that's it. Well, and again, we just go back to the, to, the, to the thing that the principles are not being taught adequately. And, um, and again, we, we came out at school here uh, with the help of, of again, Dr. Gudeker and, and Dr. Naylor, who are editors. They came out with an ebook on the removable partial dentures. And it's a phenomenal ebook. This also, is your this is your second ebook recommendation. So the, the last one was, was on, ehuman.com on on occlusion. On occlusion. What, what's what's uh, how did they find this ebook? Well, this one is also on ehuman. Oh, it's on the same website. Yeah. Okay, ehuman. And and it's on removable partial dentures. There are videos. There are photos. Oh, there it is. Oh, so here's the products. Three D at ehuman.com, 3D Tooth Atlas 9, 3D mm -hmm. Tooth Atlas 8, 3D Tooth Atlas and Hygiene Edition, 3D Occlusion Atlas 3, Removable Partial Dentures, and Head and Neck Anatomy. So right now you're talking about removable partial dentures. And Complete Dentures is coming soon. So we're working on it now. So are these your books? No, no, no they're not my book. I contributed to, to some chapters in them. But these, are, these, are, these, are, these books have been edited by, by Dr. Charles Goodacre and Dr. Pat Naylor, who are the editors. Now, I, I only contributed a couple chapters here and there. Um, yeah, that's a, a nice way to learn a digital um, format. You know, um, what I thought was interesting is... Um, exquisite. 
when I was learning how to place implants, I got my fellowship in the Mission Institute and my diplomat in the International Congress for Implantology. I, I needed a lot of volunteer cases, you know, and you only have so many uh, research monkeys in your family tree. You know, you only have so many aunts and uncles. But I was always amazed to this day how many of my patients that have full dentures, they say, I, I don't have any problems. Like, like they'll come in and, and, and you'll see them and, and I'll just say, you know, I'll start talking to them about, you know, the, their different options. And they're like 70 years old and they've had these dentures for 40, 50 years. They say, I, I, you're talking about solving a problem I don't have. I mean, and I, I think it's hard for a lot of people um, with their uh, full dentition to comprehend that. But there's a lot of really happy denture wearers who wouldn't even get implants if they were free. I think, and, and, and you're right about it, because there is a study where they gave patients the option of having implants for free to support an implant-supported overdenture, and they didn't want it. So that nearly 44% of these people that in, in that study that they suggested to them to get two implants for free, they didn't want it. And, and Howard, the best patients are those who come to you wanting an implant. But if you force them or if you push them to get an implant, these are not, they're not going to be necessarily happy patients and they might give you a hard time. And again, uh, a lot of my patients come in, they say, oh, I want implants. I said, wait until I get you the dentures. And then most of the time, after they get their dentures, they're so comfortable that they don't want implants anymore. So again, it, the knowledge of anatomy, the knowledge of, of occlusion, the knowledge of what you're doing is very important in complete dentures. And, and once you follow these principles, the dentures, they're absolutely no problem to be comfortable. One of the major issues that I've seen talking about occlusion is, is the, the, the lab remount. 99% of my patients, when they come complain about their, occlusion, about their dentures, it's because the occlusion is off. And then I, I know that, I look at it, and I figure out what the problem is, and I, and I get a new one, and I make money out of it. But a lot of my colleagues could, could, make, could make their patients happy if they just do a lab remount. And that's something that not a lot of people teach the students to do. Yeah, um, exactly. Um, so now I want to, um, you know, again, if you're just coming out of school, you know, when, when you come out of school, the first two or three years, I mean, when, when you look at a, a distribution of all the dentistry done from insurance companies, um, you know, there's just, you, you look at millions of uh, things done. It's just four big spikes on the six-year molar. I mean, what tooth is most likely to have MOD? What tooth is most likely to be crowned, root canal, extracted, a, pl a single implant? It's always six-year molars. So I know uh, you're all that in a bag of chips, but what advice would you give a 25-year-old coming out of school um, advice on just a single unit crown, the, you know, the, 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 the most common procedure done? As they're trying to, you know, they're, they're going to have to do a thousand of them before they even really master that. Well, I think the, the, my message to these young colleagues is whatever you do, use ethics. And most of the, of the, of the, the, the times I see things done, you know, unethically, um, whether it's, it's a filling with a lot of voids, and I'm sure they don't even use it rubber dam. And if, it's, if it's a post, they stick in there, paper clips, they stick. I mean, I've seen, I've seen crazy stuff being, being stuck into a root canal and, and they don't even belong there. Um, you know, all, all what it is is, is it, it's going to take you five years to get in a, in a comfortable level of your practice, of whatever you do, to, to acquire the skills of working with an assistant, to acquire working in a dental office, to, to build up your knowledge about doing all these procedures it's going to take you five years for anybody to start getting a little bit of experience. But my message is within these five years, learn to do things ethically. And, and I think that's the, the, the only message I have for these young colleagues. And there seems to be, um, oh, I don't, I don't want to get into uh, politics or anything like that, but it seems like trust has been eroding uh, in America for like 30 years. I mean, it seems like 30 years ago, more people are likely to trust their political leaders, their dentist, their physician, their this and that. But I, I think uh, trust is everything because you're selling the invisible. I mean, I know when I buy bottled water what I'm buying. I don't need anybody to explain to me bottled water and iPhone. But when, someone, but when you take your car into the dealership because your engine light came on, and I grew up with five sisters and played Barbie dolls till I was 12, so I have no idea what's underneath that hood. 
and yeah. some guy's looking at you telling you need a new alternator it's all on trust and when they come into this dental office and you tell me i have four cavities i mean what how do they know and uh you know it, it it all comes down to your what you're saying your word of mouth reputation your trust your integrity just slow down and do it right it, it takes time to build trust you're right the patient comes in you tell him hey you need a full mouth rehab that's forty thousand dollars I mean, it's it's a cost of a car. It's a cost of a brand new car. So the guy, as you said, he's buying something. He's not gonna see until a couple months down the road. So you're right. They need, it needs they need to be trust. But that trust, you build it. You build it from the first patient you see in the office. And you know more than I do how it how difficult it is to build a good reputation, and and to build trust among your patients because these people, when they trust you and they know you're doing the good job. They're going to refer you to their friends and their, their colleagues and their, their family, and, and then your practice is going to grow. So, yes, building trust is very difficult, and it takes time. And, and, and again, ethics is very important. And unfortunately, a lot of young dentists and colleagues are going into some practice models that are forcing them to do unethical things because down the road, they say either you do it or you're fired. And I have a lot of my students come back to me and say, well, I went working here and there. I, mean, I don't want to put names because it's not, it's, not, it's not our purpose here. And then he goes, they forced me to do six MODs for the, for the patient that didn't have any. And then they told me either this or you're fired. So it, it is difficult for, for these young people. As you said, they graduate. They have hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. And they're under pressure to perform and make money and pay their debts. Of course, they're going to be pushed. But again... You need to have a little bit of ethics and use your common sense. Some some dentists think that if a patient, if they make a denture and the patient needs an adhesive, that it's a failure. Uh, do, you, do you think there's a place for adhesive in a successfully made denture, or do you think it's a sign that it wasn't done right? I love that. Well, I usually tell my students, if you deliver in a new denture and you give the patient a tube of adhesive, so as if you're telling them, hey, I, dude, I made a, a lousy denture and I want you to compensate for my mistakes using the adhesive. That's how I look at it, honestly. So for me, yes, there is a room for adhesive, but that room is when a patient requirements of retention is very high, but they can't afford implants. So, you know, the, the implants are there to retain the dentures in place. So if, if there's nothing to retain these dentures except adhesive, they can use it. But I, I don't necessarily believe that every denture when you deliver, you need to give, it, give the patient a tube of adhesive. That's not really, for me, it's a signature of failure. Another thing, um, what, what I love about, uh, one of the things I love the most about America, I mean, you go to a lot of countries and every, almost all the people are, you know, one origin. And in Phoenix, I mean, I have patients from every corner of the earth and I'll tell you what, I'm a big fan. Oh, yeah, you're in California. I mean, uh, um, probably you have probably every country within a mile of you. But I see these people coming from other countries where they call them a spider. So it's a one-tooth removable crown. And in yeah. America, they would make that bar go all the way around, or they would even do it. But um, in America, they say, well, there's a million attorneys, and what if they swallow that and they aspirate it? But they all love it, and it's just one tooth with cla Have you ever seen one, a spider? I've seen that. I've seen that in my, some of my European patients, you're right, and some of them come in asking for it, and I'm, I'm not sure, but I think in California it's illegal to make these. But th I think there was a lawsuit that somebody swallowed one of these, and after that it became that no, nobody's, nobody does these anymore. But, yes, in, in a sense, you're right. It's, it's one way to give a patient uh, uh, probably a, not an ideal solution, but maybe for them it's probably the best solution because they can't afford implants or FPDs or, or any other alternative treatment that they can come out with. But again, I, I personally don't do them, but I've seen them seen them being done. Well, you don't want to do something illegal, but you're, you're saying they're illegal in California. Say that again? You, you're saying they're actually illegal, though, in California. I, I assume. I'm, I'm not pretty sure, yeah. but I assume they are. And, um, um, and then here's another diagnosing question. Um, one of the things that I, I have a little um, cringe in my stomach about is, you know, going back 30 years ago, you'd have some 60-year-old um, lady and she uh, had um, 
a partial and you place two implants and did two, three unit bridges on both sides. Mm -hmm. Now fast forward 10, 20, 30 years, she's in a nursing home and one of those implants failed. And I'm always looking at these thinking, my God, why did I do two implants for three tooth? If I would have done three implants for three tooth, then um, she would have lost an implant, but she wouldn't have lost the case. Do you, what, what are you thinking um, when you uh, see three unit bridges um, on dental implant supported where it's two implants for a three unit bridge? Do you think that's going cheap? No, no, I think it's, it's, a, it's an alternative treatment plan where you, you give a patient two implants for a three unit FPD. Uh, if they can afford more, well, you can have, give them three implants with three single teeth, of course. I mean, but, you know, as you said, there's, there's a lot of patients, and, and I'm seeing these a lot, patients that get the implants where they were, let's say, 50, and they get implants here and there. Now they are 80 or 76, and they, they're losing their natural teeth because they're getting older, and they still have their implants intact. And then this, you have to transform them into um, an implant-supported FPD but the, uh, or, or implant-supported um, overventures. But the problem is sometimes they retire, they don't have money, because they, what they get from the government is very little for them to be able to afford big uh, uh, rest restorations. So they, they have to go with either uh, implant-supported RPDs or, or implant-supported overventures. But again, Coming back to, to, to that patient that, let's, let's say, received two implants on a three-unit uh, implant-supported FPD, in case they lose one of these implants, but there, there's no contraindication if they don't have any health issues to get another implant and, let's say, get, get two crowns in there. So, I mean, there, there's no r rules of how many implants you have to get and, and how can you predict if these implants are going to fail and or which one is going to fail. You can't. So, um... You guys, uh, California, um, opened up a new dental school. So you had uh, in Pomona. Um, so you had two up north in um, University of California, San Francisco, uh, um, University of Pacific. Um, and then you had UCLA, USC, you had Loma Linda. Did you think um, California needed a sixth dental school? Or do you think uh, on, on the supply and demand equation, is that, was that good? Or do you think it's overkill? Or what, what were your thoughts on the Pomona Dental School, Western <laughs> University of Health Science. As you say, we don't want to talk politics, but honestly, <laughs> I, I don't know what was the motive. Was it? The, I don't know if it was a government decision, or, or I mean, or is it univer at the university level? I have absolutely no idea. But what I know is that the problem with California is you you graduating all these dentists, but they all leaving. They all going to Arizona, Colorado, Texas. And, and, and I rarely are staying here because it's, it's competitive, it's harsh, California is expensive by itself, cost of living is much more than going to Texas or, or Arizona or Colorado. So, and, and I don't know what's the purpose of having a, a six dental school. But all what I know is that now you, you got the same cake, but instead of, I'm talking about Southern California, instead of having three dental schools take from that cake, then you have now four dental schools picking, digging into that same cake. So it, it has probably reduced the number of patients in all the dental schools because it's got more going now to Western. And how close, uh, I'm not good on my geography out there, how close is uh, Pomona from Loma Linda? Um, you can say probably 37, 40 miles. So pretty West, close. Much. Yeah, it's pretty close. And uh, Western to USC, it's pretty much the same distance. So, and, and in USC to UCLA, I mean, they, they're pretty much close to each other. I mean, the only ones that are further apart are UCLA and Loma Linda because one is on the west, one is on the east. But all the others are just pretty much close. I so, can't believe we went over an hour, man. That was the fastest hour I've ever done in dentistry. I could talk to you for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, was well, there any questions I wasn't smart enough to ask you or no. that you wish we had talked about? No, I mean, I, I, just what, what I really want to stress for these young colleagues, and, and I wish I could, could talk to each one of them um, personally, but my, my, my advice to them is do your work ethically, keep working hard, keep learning, and there's a lot of opportunities for them to learn what you guys did and how it's specifically you 
with dental t- dental town and the opportunities that you're giving these kids, it's priceless. So I- again, they need to take advantage of that. When, when it comes to, to treatment planning, look at the big picture. Don't only focus on these little things. Don't forget it's a whole mouth you're looking at. And, and when, when you're talking complete dentures, remember your anatomy because people have the tendency to forget the anatomy that they, they, they're registering and where these dentures need to sit. When it comes to implant, make sure you use genuine components that fit on these implants. I know there's a lot of material that you can buy for cheaper to restore your cases, but it will down the road fire back. So use genuine components. Make sure your occlusion is, is nicely done. Avoid cement in the sulcus. So that's mostly where, where I can do. And, and for the CAT cam, embrace technology. It's here to stay. I think CAT cam removable, fixed, they are, are going to replace the traditional way of doing things. But it doesn't mean they need to forget the basics. Basics are very important regardless of what technology you're going to be using. It doesn't matter if it's an Itero, if it's a CEREC, if it's whatever. It doesn't really matter. You can buy anything you want, provided you follow the principles, understand where you're going, and you do it right. Well, you know, old guys like me, you know, we always went to bricks and mortar conventions, and we learned everything in, in, a, in a convention. But these these uh, millennials, we put up 411 online courses on Dental Town. Their views are coming up on a million. Uh, it would be an honor if you ever uh, wanted to create an online CE course on any of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be a, a huge honor. And they're watched all around the world. It's so cool uh, yeah. to see them uh, listening to these things in every country on earth. But, uh, hey, it was just a huge honor for you to come on the show. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. I'm humbled that you, you've asked me to be there. I'm, I'm, I'm really humbled, and I thank you very much for the opportunity. And I'll be looking forward to do that probably another time. Be more than glad to do that. Ah, thank you so much. And what's really romantic is when these kids say, uh, in uh, from South America, Africa, Asia, they say, you know, it take two months wages to buy a plane ticket just to L.A. to hear yeah. someone speak. And now they're on their Samsung uh, watching this stuff. And uh, they just it's so neat how the world's two million dentists yeah. now all live within a smartphone. It uh, is. I did not see that coming 30 years ago. <laughs> let them, let them, let them, let them, there's, there's a lot of opportunity that are going to be coming out with, with a lot of ebooks. And um, a, a lot of, and, and again, one more thing I wanted to say about CE, about CE, um, I, I know you have credibility and, you, and, and you're doing the right thing. So I'm, I'm not talking about you, but I'm talking about th- there's a lot of CE courses that are there. They, they need to, to cr- scrutinize before getting into any type of, of CE courses. I've been, mean, you know, they, they send them like a weekend course. They, they, they take their money and, and, and they make them feel that they know a lot of things. And, 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 and unfortunately, they go back to their practice, place the implants in the wrong position because they haven't been taught how to do it right, and they get in trouble. So, again, they need to understand that not everybody is capable of doing CE courses, and, and they need to, to, to look at the history of whoever has given that CE course and how long has it been. You have been there for so long. You're doing an amazing job educating young dentists, and, and, and they, should, they should definitely stick to something that, that you're presenting because you guys have credibility there. But there's a lot of people who don't. You and, know, and I've been lately, I've been getting all of my advanced diplomas off of eBay. I, the other night I bought a black belt in karate, and a, uh, I'm an oral surgeon, and, uh, and I got an Eagle Scout all for nine ninety nine on eBay. <laughs> hey thank you so much for coming on the show uh great right. podcast thank and you. uh ryan thank you too i hope you have a rocking great evening thank you same to you guys